Hello and welcome back. Come follow me with fair, faithful answers to New Testament questions. I am Jennifer Roach. Today we are going to talk about priesthood of all believers. We are we are almost done <laughs> with this year of Come Follow Me in New Testament. We've been going through looking at some of the questions that evangelicals might have about our faith, some better ways to understand them. So maybe we're gonna have some better conversations, talk through some stuff in ways that they might be able to actually hear what we're saying. Um, it's also Thanksgiving week, so happy Thanksgiving to, um, folks in the U.S. If you celebrate, we got snow on the mountains here in Utah County. It's beautiful. I hope it's beautiful where you are, um, whether you celebrate Thanksgiving or not. So there you go. Um, okay. Today we are going to talk about one of the most misunderstood verses in the New Testament, or maybe I should say misunderstood concepts especially when it comes to conversation between the evangelicals and Latter-day Saints. And we're talking about the priesthood of all believers. And we get our kind of jumping off verse 1 Peter 2, 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacri sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, no Latter-day Saint that I know of would disagree with those verses or verses that are like them. We're not quibbling about, is this translated properly? Is this a real verse or not? Like everybody would be like, yeah, oh yeah, of course. What are you talking about? Um, the question becomes, what is meant by priesthood? And as with most things, especially around here, digging into the history and the language is gonna help us clear up some confusion I hope on the other side of this, you have a different understanding of, of what the New Testament is trying to say about priesthood. So we we just have to start with the history. Um, rewind all the way back to before the Protestant Reformation. So 1517, Martin Luther um, had had it with the corrupt practices in the Catholic Church. He nails his 95 thesis to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. Um, we call it the 95 thesis, but essentially it's one big, long complaint that he has in this document. He goes on to have other complaints, but in this one, he really is making one point and nailing it to the door of the church. That's sort of what was available to him. He didn't have social media. Um, so you nailed things to the church door. I don't know. Um, that that's what he did. Most of this document, the 95 Thesis, has to do with the corrupt concept of purgatory and of paying of indulgences. Um, indulgences were purchased for money by living people, in essence, to shave off some of the time a dead person would spend in purgatory. Now, sometimes indulgences have wrongly been thought of as purchasing, like, a free pass to go commit some sin. And there probably was some of that happening. Um, but for the most part, indulgence, indulgences meant your loved one who has now passed has to do 10,000 years in purgatory. And if you pay the church this amount of money, we'll shave off 5,000 years. That That's how they conceptualized indul indulgences. Luther was really upset about the idea that a living person could impact the experience a dead person was having without that person, that dead person having to accept the work and without the living person having to offer anything other than money. So Luther wasn't even primarily mad about the idea that a living person could do some proxy work for a dead person. He, 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 he's not raging against that. What he's raging against is that the indulgences discouraged the purchaser from doing, um, Luther calls them works of mercy, basically like good Christian living um, in a way that would cause their own soul to grow. His logic was, how can an impious person on earth impact the piety of a person in purgatory um it, it it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to him it doesn't make any sense to us either right like he's pointing something out that's happening by way of the implications of it 
not by way of the practice of it, which is interesting. Um, it would be as if we were baptizing um, for the dead, but there was no requirement either for the person, the living person doing the work to have some kind of proof that they're living a righteous life and, and, and no expectation that the dead person would ever have to accept the ordinance, that it was just done and, and that was it. And whether they liked it or not, their work had been done. That, that's, what, that's what Luther's mad at, basically. By the end of the 95 thesis, thesis, Luther makes it clear that he's not trying to do away with proxy work altogether. He just wants to have it done in a way that generates righteousness from living people and requires the dead person to accept the work. That, that, that's kind of his conclusion. What Luther is trying to do, it, it, he states this very clearly, very upfront in 95 Thesis, is he's trying to have a scholarly conversation with the religious leaders and educated people of his day. That he's not trying to start a reformation. He isn't even trying to teach the common people. He's trying to have a conversation with his peers other religiously educated people. But by 1520, just, just three years later, the whole thing is already spinning out of control for, for, for Martin. Um, the conversation morphs into what is the role of the priest in forgiveness? Are they the ones that are actually deciding if you're forgiven? Or are they the ones who pronounce forgiveness upon you but that forgiveness is granted from Christ, not the priest. And that piece right there is where we're going to pick up the thread. Luther goes on to talk about lots of other things. This isn't a comprehensive history of Luther. So, so we're going to pick up on that piece. The what is a priest and what are they doing part. So um, things are not going well for our boy Martin, um, at least in terms of debate among his academic peers. He wanted to be having this academic conversation, and he certainly did get some of that. But the people are starting to understand at least a little bit of what he's talking about, and they start to see some of the implications. And, and Luther sees this too. We can see his theology kind of pro progressing on this. In 1520, um, he puts out a document that has the very unfortunate name, if you are standing on this side of history, um, he puts out a document called The Christian Nobility of the German Nation. Now, you and I hear that a little differently post-World War II. Um, he doesn't mean it with any like white supremacist overtones to it, um, or at least he wouldn't say he didn't mean it with, with supremacist overtones to it. He, he's trying to help the people see themselves um, in a higher light, a more a more noble light, a more priest-like light. This document is where he really lays out his growing idea on the priesthood of all believers. And what he's trying to do is react against the pre-Reformation idea that humans are really divided into two groups, the secular and the sacred. So, before, before the Reformation, if you lived in some little German town, there would be the regular people li living their lives. They're mostly they're just trying to feed themselves and, and their families. These are, these are considered the secular people, even if they were followers of Christ, even if they had a deep belief, even if they were in church every Sunday, they were considered the secular people because their occupation was secular. They, they were a farmer, they were a weaver, they were a whatever, um, and those are secular um, professions, and so they were considered secular people. The sacred people were the priests and those who had taken holy orders to live in the monastic communities, um, monks and nuns and others. Um, so how it played out was that the secular people, the, the, the people who believed in Christ, they didn't actually have very much access to materials that would help them learn the scriptures or help them grow on their own. And, I mean, they kind of give up in a sense in that they let the sacred people, the priests and the nuns and the, and the monks, take on this burden of spiritual growth on their behalf. 
So it's sort of this attitude of, hey, I'm just a regular person. I don't need to spend my day praying because those monks up on the hill in the monastery, they're spending their days praying on my behalf so that I can go out and be a farmer. Um, and you can see wh where Luther gets upset at this. He's not mad about the like the proxiness of it, that the priests and nuns are praying for the people. He's mad that the secular people are sort of sidestepping their own responsibility to grow. They're outsourcing their spiritual tasks to the priests and the monks and the nuns. There's a difference between someone doing a proxy work for you and you giving up and outsourcing it and letting them do it. Um, in addition, the monasteries, um, the system was set up so that they prayed at fixed points throughout the day, including in the middle of the night. Um, the system of prayer became more and more elaborate, requiring more and more time. And the regular folks just trying to live their lives and feed their families couldn't live on a schedule of prayer like that. So instead of, instead of modifying that in a way that would work for these people, they mostly just left it to the monks and nuns to take care of the prayers for them. And Luther's mad because it leaves the regular people spiritually immature. And he wants to correct this situation. And so he writes about it in Nobility of the German People, or Nobility of the German Nation. So one of Luther's goals becomes emptying those monasteries. He wants everyone secular people and sacred people to together do the work of prayer and Christian living. Um, the term liturgy, and it develops a lot of its meaning around this time. Liturgy, lit the literal translation of it is the work of the people. And you can see how Luther is using this term in a very particular way. He wants the regular people to do spiritual work too not just the the sacred people but in order to do that he has to break them out of their system that they have going that separates the sacred from the secular people so he spends a lot of time and energy teaching that the regular people also have a priesthood responsibility that they have a priesthood to which they belong the priesthood of all believers, Luther doesn't ever actually use that phrase. He uses universal priesthood. He uses lots of other things. It's mostly what it gets called these days, priesthood of all believers, and that there are responsibilities to that priesthood, um, and that it, that it matters. So Latter-day Saint friends, I don't think there is much for you probably that you disagree with in all of this. There's nothing like shocking oh no luther was so wrong like i i don't think you're hearing that tell me tell me if you are write something write me something in the comment comments i'd love to know what luther is doing is is pretty reasonable in, in lots of ways but let's flip out of luther's german world context and into our english speaking context and you're going to see how the problem has developed to where we are so very often when you're translating from biblical Greek into English, you have a lot more English words to choose from than you do Greek words. Maybe it's one to eight. One Greek word, you have eight possible English words you could use depending upon the nuance you want to bring to that for your translation. But in some instances, it works the other way around. Greek has more words for something than English does. Um, Probably the best example that you're familiar with is the various words for love, right? In, in Greek, there's a whole bunch of words for love, and they are trying to describe some important nuances between different forms of love. But in English, we use the same word love for lots of things. I love pizza. and I love my child are two very different kinds of love, but we use the same word. It's really the only word that's available to us. Um, the same thing is going on in the situation with the word priesthood. We have one word, pre priest. We don't have words that have a ton of nuance. We have priesthood. The New Testament has two words, one that means 
sacred person and the other that means a person with elderhood or an ordained person. So when Luther says you're the priesthood of all believers, he means you are not just the, the secular people who have nothing to do with spirituality of those monks and nuns. You too are sacred people. Even if you're just living your normal lives, taking care of your family, working on your farm, milking your cow, that work is also sacred. It's also part of your spiritual development and seeing it that way helps you grow instead of just outsourcing all your work to the, the professionals. He never, Luther never intended to say that there aren't two different kinds of priesthoods. The, the, the one we're talking about right now, the priesthood of all believers, it, it, it's a universal priesthood that everyone who claims the name of Christ has. The priesthood that asks us to do spiritual work for ourselves, to those over whom we have responsibility as children, to those who are partners and, and friends to us, that, that we together, your ward together, your, your family, your whatever together, that we're building each other up in these ways. That's priesthood of all believers. Of course, we believe in that. We, we, we do that all the time, right? Um, the other form of the word for priesthood, the one who has eldership, this is an ordained person, a person who has gone through a process, a person who has hit some criteria, a person who has proven that they are worthy to hold that priesthood. Um, Luther never says that just because the, the, the priesthood of all believers exists, he didn't say, well, the priesthood of being in eldership doesn't exist. He still believes in both. And so what about our evangelical friends? <laughs> What do they make of all of this? Well, as we have talked about a number of times here, evangelicals value two things above everything else, independence and devotion to Christ. When I say independence, what I mean is they do not want to be told what to believe by anyone who claims authority. To them, the very claim toward authority is problematic. It probably proves that you don't have authority if you claim authority. They want an absolutely level playing field where no person has authority over any other. The only exception really might be when we're talking about children. Um, but every adult who believes in Christ stands absolutely equal with every other adult in terms of authority structure. They want to do what they believe God is calling them to do. I mean, you get the appeal of that, I'm sure. It's, um, it feels very direct, it's very personal, it's very conviction driven. Um, but evangelicals also value devotion to Christ. And the concern here is that they don't want anybody standing between them and Christ, not monks up on a hill, not priests that help with confession and repentance, not even the, the local church to which they belong as a church member. If they don't like what is being taught, they see no obligation to stay. They move to another church. Um, in practice, what this means is that they each have to be their own prophet. They don't get or want guidance that comes with authority. They are the authorities over themselves. They also see Christ as being not just the great high priest, but the only current priest of any type. That Christ, if we need help, Christ is the one that we look to, never another human being who's fallible just as we are. Um, and to be honest, I mean, evangelicals and Latter-day Saints are really not that far apart from each other right here. We too ultimately look to Christ. Your, your leaders might tell you something and you might need a minute to go home and pray about it and think about it and ponder about it. No one in our church is teaching some kind of blind obedience to a leader just because they're in leadership. Um, we, we are also not far from evangelicals on this when they say priesthood belongs to Christ alone. 
We say it differently. We say priesthood is the power of God on the earth. But what we're saying is priesthood belongs to God. It is his priesthood sometimes bestowed onto worthy human people, um, his power exercised on the earth. But evangelicals worry that any claim to priesthood is an attempt to take away power from God and give it to man, which also takes away um, or, or would, would put it put in the way another person between you and God. Um, there, there is also, there's another complication, and it's the development of the kind of philosophical arc that has taken place during the time the evangelical movement has begun and grown up. Um, they began right alongside the kind of post-World War II modern movement. They move into sometimes what gets called the hyper-modern right along with the rest of culture. And frankly, they move into the postmodern movement along with the rest of culture. The natural consequences of this are that the concept of authority itself is invalidated. Think of how people conceptualize um, books. So it used to be that an author had a meaning in mind. She would write her thoughts and people who wanted to understand what she's on about would read the book, but the author got the final say. The, the The author gets to say what the words mean. The author gets to interpret themselves. Sometimes people would say, oh gosh, I wonder what this or that element means in a book. I wish I could go talk to this writer and find out more of what they were thinking. A very clear example of where the author is seen as authority. Those two words are related, right? Um, but in the postmodern turn, it's the reader who brings meaning to the book. The, the reader decides what it means, even if that meaning is wildly different from what the author intended. The reader gets the final word. There is an important philosophical concept in, in postmodernism, started back in the 1960s, and it's this saying, the author is dead. Sometimes you hear it said as God is dead. Um, author and authority are, are very much linked. Um, by natural progression, the very concept of authority dies when the author dies. The author is dead. Authority is also dead. And we see this play out all the time in our national debates. Who is an authority anyway? Is the guy at home with an internet connection just as much of an authority as the guy with a PhD? Large parts of our current culture would say yes. He he did his he did his research, is what they would say about internet guy and PhD guys. Research is seen as exactly the same, despite the obvious difference. Authority has died. And this is the culture that the evangelical movement has grown up alongside. Any authority that comes with priesthood is bad. It, it, it's actually not bad. It's non-existent, it, at least to them. Only the common authority that anyone has over their own lives matters. It's the idea of, um, you can say what you want as long as it's true and authentic for you. It, but don't try to make it true and authentic for anybody else. That's the kind of the ethos here. Um, but as you probably know, history predicts the future. These things are cyclical. At some point, things change. Um, and, and maybe there are hints that in some ways our society is starting to grapple with the authority problem. Um, just by way of example, if you look in last week's Deseret News, you will find an article titled, Want to Fix Education? bring back authority. Like interesting, right? If you know anyone who's a school teacher, you have heard about the kind of craziness that is happening um, in, I won't say all, but many public schools um, and teachers have completely lost their authority. And in some ways it's been taken from them. Um, and so this idea of, huh, we might have swung too far and we need to swing back, not, not uh, too much authority, 
we're going to go swinging back and forth forever. Um, just by way of note, you will also find an article in Deseret News last week with my name on it. It's a summary of the presentation I gave at FAIR. It's a lovely article. Go go and read it. Anyway, um, bring back authority. It is essentially we're talking about the same thing here. But when we're talking about priesthood, evangelicals have like deauthorized, taken the authority out of priesthood. Um, and at some point, perhaps that authority goes back in. I don't know if you or I will be alive to see that, um, but I, I think that's what happens at some point. Um, okay, this got to be a long episode. I'm sorry for that. Um, to summarize, the basic idea is evangelicals gravitate towards priesthood of all believers, which is a very real biblical concept that we also believe in, but they gravitate towards that to the exclusion of any type of ordained priesthood, mostly because priesthood of all believers is completely flat. No one has authority over each other. Um, each one gets to be a prophet to themselves in the evangelical view, not in our view. Um, and it's a completely democratized version of, of religion. Nobody gets the final say. So you end up getting about 20,000 different says. Um, Okay, I hope that helps you understand what your evangelical friends are saying when they're talking about this. When they kind of throw priesthood of all believers at you, you, your mind might not have gone down the same trail that my mind goes down, but I hope some of those thoughts help you have some good conversations. Okay, we have five episodes left. Next week, we are talking about the Holy Ghost and asking, what does it mean when an evangelical also experiences the Holy Ghost. What's that about? I think you will be fascinated by that one, and I will see you then.